Stem and leaf displays. At first glance, they can be a little intimidating, hard to understand. Once we look at it, we should have a better understanding. So a stem and leaf display contains all the information found in a histogram, but we preserve the original data values in the process. So whereas in a histogram, you just see a bar and how many there are, a stem and leaf display shows you the actual data values that would be in that bar. When we are picking um, the numbers, we don't round them. Because remember in a histogram, we're keeping things in like a, an interval from like 10 to 15 and or like 10 to 20. So if we round up, we're moving it out of that, like a, a 19 is between 10 and 20. If we rounded it to 20, now it's in a different bar. So instead of um, rounding, we do what's called truncate, which we just chop off the rest of the values. We're just looking at the ones we need. We can have up to two digits in the stem, but we are only one digit in the leaf. There are no commas. There are no like lines to separate the different numbers in the leaf. And we have to make sure to label what the place values are. Okay. So what does that look like? In the Super Bowl, by how many points does the winning team outscore the losers? Here are the winning margins for the first 42 Super Bowl games. Create a stem and leaf display. So this first display is going to show us how to make one without having to worry about truncating. Okay, so we have values. Our lowest value um, is one. And I believe our highest value, this is not a negative, that's just like a, you know, the next line. Uh, and I believe our highest value is the 45, which was probably when the Chargers made it to the Super Bowl because it was bad. So um, we have to decide what our stem and our leaf is going to be. We separate the stem and the leaf by a line, and the numbers need to go in order. Okay. So if one is our smallest, the we have to use two decimal places. So our stem is going to be the tenths place, tens place, and the leaf is going to be the ones place. So one is going to be zero, one. Okay, we treat that as zero, one. So we make a line. Let me make it over here. That was a really bad line. And then we start and make a number line. Zero, one, two, three, four was our highest tens place, right? Because 45 was our maximum. And for each number, we put the ones place, the number that's in the ones place, in the column next to the number that is in its tens place. So for the very first, we're first going to just do it without putting it in order, and then we'll rearrange the leaves in order. Okay. To me, I think it's easier to just go through the list than trying to find, like, okay, this is my lowest, where's the next lowest. Um, then we can put it in order pretty simply after we make the original stem and leaf display, or stem plot, also known as a stem plot. Okay, so you're drawing this in your notes. This is in your packet, right, this example. So we have 25, okay, so 25 goes in the two row because the tens place is two and the ones place is what? Five. So we put the five in the leaf. So this is red, 25. 19 is our next one. So what, which number is it going to go next to? The one. What number am I going to put as my leaf? The nine. Okay. Uh, the next one is nine. What number does nine go next to? Zero. And my leaf is nine. Okay. The next one is 16. Okay. That's going to go next to the one. My leaf is six. I do not separate my leaves with anything but a little bit of space. They're meant to be treated like the dots in a dot plot. The numbers replace the dot. It preserves our data for us. So instead of just looking at a dot at 10, 
I can see that I have one value that's um, 19. Oh, wait. Where did that go? It went away. And I have one value that's 16. Okay. And then the next one is 3. So where does that go? Where does the 3 go? With the 0. And it's just going to stack next to the 9. Notice I'm trying to keep the second row, I'm trying to keep them all lined up, right? This works really great on graph paper because you would just put one number in each box and it keeps it all nice and evenly spaced so you can see the shape and um, so you can see the shape of the graph. Okay. All right, what do you think? You think you can finish building this? Okay, I'm going to give you a few minutes to work on building. Okay, so let's finish this up. We have 21, 7, 17, 10, 4, 18, 17, 4, 12, 17, 5, 10, 29, 22, 36, 19, 32, 4, 45, 1, 13, 35, 17, 23, 10, 14, 7, 15, 7, 27, Yours looks like. Okay. Now, when we look at a stem and leaf display, we want to make sure as we describe our shape that we're looking to where it's trailing off. Is it trailing off to higher numbers? That's skew right. If it's trailing off towards the lower stems, then it's skewed left. Okay, so this one would be considered skewed to the right, right? Because the trailing off. Here is to the higher numbers. Okay. And from a stem and leaf display, we can find the exact center once it's in order. Okay. This is an, not a finished stem and leaf display because my leaves should start from the smallest and go to the largest. Okay. So now we want to rearrange it so that it's in order. Okay. So I'm going to redraw it. And I get one, we have one, two, three, four, five threes. Three fours. Five. Three sevens. A nine. Okay, so I have 14 in each zero, so that means I got them all. I'm going to rearrange the one. So I have three zeros, a one, two twos, a three, a four, five, Four sevens, we get them all, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty, forty, thirty, fifty, seventeen. Okay, and then this one should be easier, less numbers. I don't know why I put a five in my stem. Okay. Now, what does our key look like? Okay, we have to make sure we let people know, because a lot of times they don't see the data. You just are looking at the stem and leaf plot. You need to know what place value each number is. Okay. So the way 
the standard key is to take one data value, it doesn't matter which one, I'll just take the low one, and write for line five, so the stem and then the line and one of the leaves, and what does that equal? That equals 45. It could be 450 without the key, we don't know, right? Because we could have truncated and that could have been 4,500 or it could have been 45,000 depending on what data we're looking at. So it's important that we identify what the place values are so we know what numbers we're looking at, okay? And so then shape-wise again, this is unimodal and skewed to the right. And we can find the center by finding the middle number. We're going to talk about median in that later in this PowerPoint, so then we're going to go back and find that, okay? Questions on making a stem and leaf plot or a stem plot? Larger numbers, yes. And skewed left will be towards small numbers. So remember also you could say positively skewed. So positive is right, negative is left. Okay. So it's like I want to pick it up. I don't know if it'll let me do this. Lock it. And then can I... Hmm. No, it's not going to let me rotate it. But be like turning it, turn your paper on its side, right? If you turn your paper on its side and the number line went this way, then you could see the skew to the right a little bit better. Okay. The problem is sometimes with a stem plot, we want to compare two sets of data. So we do a side by side stem plot where you create a set of leaves that go off in the other direction. And then that's where you really, you can't turn your paper because it's the opposite number line, okay? Um, so the next thing is calculating center. Um, the measures of center we calculate are mean, the average. How do we find the average? Add them all up. Add them all up, divide by how many there are, right? Your average quiz score, add up your quiz scores, divide by how many quizzes, right? You've been taking averages and finding means for a long time. But what's the median? That's the mode. The mode is the most repeated number. The one in the middle. The median is the middle number. Half the data is above it and half the data is below it. So the data must be in order in order to find the middle, right? Yeah, which makes a stem plot nice to look at because from a stem plot, all the data values are in order, aren't they? We just reordered them. So we can find the middle by looking just at a stem plot, not having to make a list as well. Okay. Measures of spread we use are the range. The range is the maximum minus the minimum. Uh, I think I have that here highest value minus the lowest value. That color's not showing up. Highest value minus the lowest value is your range. We have the interquartile range, also known as the IQR, which is the middle 50% of the data. It's the upper quartile minus the lower quartile. So right, middle 50% of data here. The upper quartile is the half of the middle of the upper half, the median of the upper half of the data, and the lower quartile is the median of the lower half of the data. We call them Q1 and Q3, the first quarter of the data, the third quarter of the data, right? Because if it's the half of the half, we have a quarter, quartile. Um, and standard deviation, okay? That's a calculation we're going to look at a little bit later. Uh, in this chapter. Percentiles, um, the fifth percentile is the number that falls above 5% of the data. 
Okay. So when you are talking about like your percentile rank in the class, okay, if you are in the 95th percentile of your class ranking, that means your GPA is higher than 95% of your class. If you're the 99th percentile for something, that means you are whatever it is, your height, your uh, neck size, is higher than 99% of people your age. Babies are always measured with a percentile. Okay, when you have a baby, you take them in and they're born. They're, oh, your baby was small. She's in the sixth percentile. That means she's only bigger than 6% of the babies born her age, right? And as you bring them in and they get bigger, they kind of see, did you stay in that percentile? Did you get more towards the middle, right? And then are you, did they move from the middle to the top? I have a friend whose daughter in fourth grade was like the 99.9th percentile for height. I mean, she's just the tallest little four-year-old I've ever seen, right? And she still is. She's a freshman, and I think she's over six feet tall. So, yes, she plays volleyball. <laughs> so um, that's what percentiles mean, right? So if you're in the 90th percentile, there's 10% of your class that's above you and 90% that are below you. Now, sometimes they talk about you being in the top 5%, but that's not the same as saying the 5th percentile, right? If we're talking about GPA, 5th percentile is bad. 95th percentile is good, right? Um, like I said, uh, quartiles, the lower quartile is the value with a quarter of the data below it and the median uh, it's the median of the lower half of the data. The upper quartile is a value with a quarter of the data above it. So we, when, when you're looking at the quartiles, quartile one is the 25th percentile. Right? It's the middle of the bottom half. And the 75th percentile... Um, Go away. 75th percentile is your quarter three, quartile three, the middle of the upper half of the data. We put all of this information together, the median and the quartiles, the minimum and the maximum, and it's called the five number summary. Your minimum, quartile one, your median, quartile three, and the maximum. We graph these all together in a box plot. Okay, so that was another one of the graphs I saw people saying, kind of the box plot's kind of weird. Like, where are those numbers coming from? Those numbers come from your five number summary. This bar, this point here, is your minimum. So that's the minimum value. Then the top of the bar is your Q1 or the top of that box, the bottom of the box, I guess. That's the value that is Q1. You don't know anything about the data between the minimum and Q1 if you are just looking at a box plot. You know nothing. It does show you how spread out the minimum and Q1 are, though. Then you have the median. It's a line in the middle of the box. You have the upper quartile, Q3, at the top of the box. And then your maximum is the end of the bar. And someone said, what are the extra dots out there? If there's outliers, we can put extra dots to signify those are outliers. So instead of the maximum being here, if we have three outliers, we have three dots. And then this line represents the first value that is not an outlier. Okay. So this is all the data that's not outliers. And then the little dots on the outside, sometimes they're stars, represent the data points that are outliers. Okay. So don't worry, we're going to 
do all this together and talk about that yet. The variance and standard deviation are kind of confusing. So what I'd like to do is an example of these data. I'm going, I want to write down, let me pause. An example we can all relate to, not all of us watch football, everybody eats chips and always wonders, why is there so much air in this bag of chips? Okay, it feels like you pay all this money for this bag and you get a little bit of chips. So this is the data. Um, a group of chip enthusiasts from Kitchen Cabinet Kings collected data on the percent of air in each of 14 popular brands of chips. Okay, so the winner winner is Fritos. We can all probably agree with that. You can buy a bag of Fritos who definitely have the least amount of air. I think Lay's is, well, it looks like Ruffles and Stacy's Petite, no, Cheetos is the worst. So what we need to do, let's put this data in order, okay? So our lowest is Fritos. The next is Pringles. How does a thing of Pringles have more air than Fritos? I mean, it's in a tube. Interesting, right? Um, 41, 41, oh, nope, forgot the 39 in there. She is 34, 39, now 41s, right? Uh, 45, 46, 47, 50 and 50. 49. Yep, it's hiding. It's Tara, that's those vegetable chips, right? Yeah, I think so. For like beet chips and sweet potato chips. I don't know. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, they're deep fried, they're salted. I mean, most things are pretty decent when they're deep fried and salted. So, okay, like even zucchini tastes good when it's deep fried and salted. So, all right, so now we have our data in order. We have how many, how many numbers? That's N. N is how many numbers there are. I think it said 14, right? Seven times two. 14 values, right? Okay, so I missed a number. Oh, it's 59. Oh, the 59. I left off the 59, the Cheetos. There we go. Better? Okay, so when I have 14 data, the median is in the middle. There needs to be the same number of values below the median as above the median. When I have an even number of data values, the median is not necessarily one of my data points. It's in between the two middle numbers, okay? So if there's 14 values, where's the middle of 14? Seven. Seven. So my median is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right here. That divides my data in half, right? I have seven values below the blue line, seven values below the blue line, and I have seven values above the blue line. So what actual number are we gonna write down for our median? I'm gonna average those two middle values. What's halfway between 45 and 46? 45.5. That's my middle. If there's an odd number of values, then it's the one in the middle, and then there'll be, right? So if there was 15, then it would be the eighth value, because then there would be seven below and seven above, okay? So when it's an even number, it's gonna be the average of the two middle. When it's an odd number, it's the one smack in the middle, okay? So now I wanna find Q1, the bottom half of the bottom. Sorry, the middle point of the bottom half. 
the bottom half of the bottom. So where's the middle of this bottom? The 39, right? There's seven values. The fourth number is right smack in the middle. So that is my Q1. My first quartile is 39. And where's my third quartile? Smack in the middle of the upper half is the 49. That's my Q3. Now, again, if I had an even number in the bottom half, if I have an even number here, then it's the middle, right, between the two middle values. So if there was six, it'd be between three and four. Okay. Questions on finding your quartiles or the median. Okay. I'm guessing we can probably quickly identify our minimum and our maximum. Which means now I can create a box plot. Okay. Once I have this five number summary, my minimum, my Q1, my median, my Q3, and my maximum, I can draw a box plot. I draw a number line. Okay, I can't skip numbers. Okay, I have to draw the graph above a number line. If I just put the numbers I need on the axis, it doesn't show me how spread out the data is. So I have to make a number line. The minimum is going to be 1. My maximum is going to be 59. So 19, 20, 30, Wow, I drew that line just perfect. That never happens. I always end up with either not enough or too much. <laughs> so we start, our box plot floats above our number line, okay? It doesn't touch it, it's just kind of floating up there and it allows us to compare several on the same scale. So we put a little line at our minimum, our minimum of 19. At our Q1, we're gonna create a line that's twice that size for the front of the box. Twice or three times that size. That's the beginning of the box part. These used to be called box and whisker plots. You had the box part and then the whiskers were the parts that extended from the box. My median is 45.5, another line the same size, or at least you try. And then another line at my Q3, and then I create the box with those three lines. So here's my, a line for my Q1, a line for my median, a line for my Q3, and that's, those three lines connect my box. And then I'm going to connect my minimum to the box, and then I'm going to draw my maximum out here and connect that whisker. If we're looking at a box plot, we can talk about our shape, our center, our spread, and our outliers all from this one box. The shape, can we see modes from a box plot? No, there's no peaks. So we should never talk about unimodal or bimodal from a box plot because you can't see that. But I can see that it's skewed to the left. Would you agree? That whisker is definitely trailing to the smaller number, so it's skewed to the left. Skewed left. 
with a median of 45.5. That's my discussion of center. Now, IQR is how we want to talk about spread. The IQR is Q3 minus Q1. Okay, so the IQR, I'm going to, no, it's not the, I don't want a highlighter. The IQR, Q3 minus Q1 is 49 minus 39, 10. So when we're describing spread, we say an IQR of 10. And there's probably an outlier, right? I mean, don't we think that 19 is probably an outlier? Yes, okay. We will talk as we get through the rest of the chapter about actually calculating whether or not it's an outlier. We'll come back to this example, okay? And so possible outliers. If you see the box plot with the dots separating it, it's those are clearly calculated as outliers, okay? Questions on the box plot? This is one of those that it's almost easier to make by hand than with the calculator. But the calculator does do it for us. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay. 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 So we, um, it's okay if your homework is out of order as well. I will just start with this problem, whatever it is. Well, I, don't, I know I did it first with you and graded it, so it's fine. Okay. So. It says 16 gas stations in Easter, Wisconsin posted these prices for gas. Clearly, this is old data. Oh, the days you could pay $2 for a gallon of gas, right? Um, so, yeah, when I was in college, I paid 87 cents to fill up with gas one time. Gas prices dropped so low, 87 cents. Yeah, I don't envy you guys in high school paying over $5 a gallon. It's insane. Okay, anyways, it says, make a stem and leaf display of these gas prices. Use split stems. So split stems means I'm going to have two of each number. The first one will have any leaves zero through four, and the second one will have five through nine. Okay, so it splits it up from like 20 to 24, and then 25 to 29, or 2.0 to 2.4, and then 2.5 to 2.9. Um, so, because all of our data is two, right? There's no one there. So I'm going to have two twos, use two 2.3 stems. Oh, it has us doing it like... Um, splitting it like this, basically. So 21, 21, 22, this one's not actually truncating because we can have up to two numbers in the stem. If I just used the ones place, it's not really going to show me what the distribution of the data looks like. So I have to pick um, numbers so I have at least like five different stems, right, if possible. So my first value is 2.19, okay? My first stem, 21, will only have numbers 0 through 4 as my leaves, and the second one will have 5 through 9. So the 9 goes in the second one. And the next one is 228. 2.28. Does that go in the first or the second stem? Second. In the second. So 8. 223. 22 in the first one, right? 225, second. 
okay? Zero through four, five through nine. Um, so that's the first row, column 232. So that's the first one. 235 is the second one. 230. 221. 231. 222. 225. 245. 233. 229. 229. 225. Now I need to put them in order. Okay, always have to put it in order. So we're gonna redraw it real quick. Oops. Actually, this is incorrect. 24.5, the five goes in a second stem. Right, I wasn't paying attention. So we should have two twenty fours, and the twenty, uh, the two point four five goes in the second twenty four. And then we're going to put them in order. Questions? Our key, you always have to include a key. So 24 line 5 equals 2.45. And then if it says describe the shape, how would you describe the shape? Symmetric, yes. Symmetric. Can I find the center, the median, from this data, from the graph? We have how many values? Uh, 16 gas stations. So where's the middle? Between 8 and 9, right? So as I count, I count 1. You don't count from here down. Hold on. Let me get a, that one's not showing up. Is it red better? I count from the bottom up. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, right? So between the eight, 20, 2.28 and 2.89 is my median. So right here is my median of 2.285. So the median of 2.285. Can we find the middle, the Q1 and Q3, so we can find quartile IQR? There's eight values. The middle is going to be three between the fourth and the fifth, right? So between 2.23 and 2.25 is 2.24, right? So this is Q1, 2.24. Because that's halfway between 3 and 5. Yeah? And then 1, 2, 3, 4. Halfway between 2.31 and 2.32. Here is my Q3, 2.315. And then my IQR is 2.24. You can subtract them to find your IQR. Yeah? So is that 0 0.075? So then you say IQR of 0 0.075, no apparent outliers. 
And it's also okay if you put possible outliers because maybe this one is. We don't know. We'll calculate that later. Okay.